What's up, Bruin Bible listeners? This is your host, Will Decker. I uh, wanted to reach out and say thank you guys for all the listens, all the love. We see it on social media. We see it on YouTube. It has been sensational. And we want to encourage you guys, if you guys are enjoying the podcast and liking it, that you guys subscribe and like it, uh, whether it's on YouTube, on our UCLA LAFB channel, or the Bruin Bible, uh, to subscribe either through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, however you guys listen and react to it because it's going to allow us to do much greater things in the future. We're creators. We want to be giving the best Bruins content to all of our UCLA listeners. The only way we can do that is if we have a fan base that is locked in and helping us out. So we appreciate you guys. We love you guys. If you guys have been liking it, please help us out with a like and subscribe. What is up Los Angeles Friday afternoon? The weekend is here. 1090 ESPN, the mightier with the LA Football Network show. This is Will Decker, your host, Jamal Madney, a.k.a. the Madman in the house. You know what we do, guys. We break down the UCLA Bruins, what they're going to bring to the table. Tough loss last week against Oregon State. We're going to move on from that. We're going to make sure that we are looking towards the current opponent, Stanford. Going to be a fun week, a fun game. Most importantly, Madman, how are we doing on this Friday leading in to the weekend with more football on the slate for us? You're doing great, Thriller. Always a delight being with you. And it's always a terrific weekend when we can talk UCLA football. And even better, when we can finally now talk about a game looking ahead. And we've got Oregon State finally behind us. And we can put that narrative to bed. And now we get ready for the official first game of the second half of the Bruins season. Yeah. And, you know, we had three games on the schedule where we were the underdog for. And we've lost two of those so far. USC still looms in the future. But I think with all of that being said, this is a game where I think on the outside looking in, a lot of people would expect us to win. We're still a top 25 team as it stands. The AP poll has us as number 25th in the rankings. But I want to, you know, I don't want to underestimate what momentum can be. And Stanford is coming off of the biggest comeback victory in their program's history. Troy Taylor, new first-year head coach, came in from Sacramento State, a guy that had really rebuilt that program from the top, uh, is now back, man. And he's you kind of need that first win as a coach to solidify your success, to gain confidence for the fan base and recruits coming in. That's exactly what happened last Friday evening in Boulder, Colorado. We're down 29 nothing, And we may have just seen... One of the greatest weapons unveiled within the Pac-12 and a wide receiver by the name of Elik Iomanner. Madman, it is incredibly impressive what this guy was able to do. You see the raw statistics, 13 catches, 294 yards, and three scores, all from Ashton Daniels, the quarterback who, you know, looking at the stats on the surface looks very, very good. But what's more impressive to me is Iomanner did all of this in the second half. He didn't have a catch in the first half. And I remember talking to you about Kobe Bryant and his most impressive performances. And you said the 81's great. I love the 81, but my favorite is when he scored 60 through three quarters and outscored the Mavericks. Madman, Iowa Manor had 294 yards in the second half. Colorado's entire team, and this includes overtime, had 169 yards in the second half. This guy outgained them by himself by 120 plus yards. What was that performance like in setting Stanford's all-time receiving record in a game that will be not forgotten among Pac-12 fans. Will, I just love how you set that up. Obviously, you're the big Steph Curry guy, and everyone knows I'm the big Kobe guy. So, you know, with that reference, I mean, my goodness, in my favorite reference of the year, Thriller, it's going to be hard to top that one. But, uh, you know, I would call it, I don't think it's hyperbole to say it was the most out-of-nowhere impressive performance maybe in the history of the Pac-12. When you talk about Io Manor not having a catch through the first half and then finishing with 13 catches for 294 receiving yards and three touchdowns overlaid on a situation 
where Stanford is a one in four football team. They won their first game. They lost their next four games, including a home loss to Sacramento State, a one point loss to Arizona. They got embarrassed against USC, got embarrassed against Oregon at home, and then down 29 nothing at the half against Colorado. You're talking about four and a half consecutive games of just getting their doors blown off. And from there, how easy would it have been for this team to say, you know what, we're one and four, we're, we're, we've got four consecutive losses, we're getting crushed here 29 nothing. this is just going to be a rebuilding year, we're going to try what we can and move forward and probably finish with maybe one more victory on the season, but more likely being one and 11, to then turning this thing around, Will. And then you talk about Io Manor on one side of the ball, Ashton Daniels is the guy who's throwing it to him. Daniels was the guy who got benched against SC when uh, SC was up 49-3 to at the half against Stanford, did not play after that, came in some mop-up duty against Arizona, and then he comes out and just is throwing the ball all over the yard to Io Manor, and now you've got a situation in Troy Taylor where he has a signature victory upon which to build this season for this young team. It was the most out of nowhere spectacular performance, Will, in the history of the conference. And now you almost think Stanford is approaching this game as a fresh season. They're like, you know, we've gone through all of these challenges. We've struggled. We found a way to come back. And I think this is a team that's completely rejuvenated coming into this UCLA game. On the flip side, UCLA feels like a team that's a little bit emotionally hung over from a tough, brutal, physical, pounding loss to Oregon State. So you can't really have two teams emotionally be more different right now. Now, UCLA's talent and, and where their program is is significantly greater than Stanford, as evidenced by their 17.5-point favorites uh, against this uh, team in, in Stanford at the farm. But emotionally coming into this game, it's Stanford that's on the high and UCLA on the low. Yeah. And I mean, if Daniels continues to his rise and I think he injured his hand a little bit too, the backup, Justin Lampson got in there a couple of times, didn't really make a dent, but looking at Daniels raw numbers, even with struggling early in that USC game, 60% of his passes completed seven touchdowns, two interceptions. It just seems like Troy Taylor has found his wide receiver and quarterback combination moving into the future. I mean, these are guys that, you know, uh, Io Manor is a redshirt freshman and so is Daniel. So they're going to, he's going to have these guys at least for another year in the fold to build upon. So that was a huge thing for them. And, you know, every program just needs that one signature victory to keep it going. Ironically, Jim Harbaugh, do you remember when he was an underdog against USC? That was kind of the catalyst, the train that got that Stanford, uh, you know, bus moving. Uh, for Jim Harbaugh, which he eventually... Well, that was the, the second greatest comeback in the history of college football in terms of from an underdog standpoint. 41 and a half point underdog Stanford was in 2007, and it set the stage. They beat SC 24-23, set the stage for the success with Harbaugh. And Will, the one thing I'll make a point of, earlier in the year, Troy Taylor is a spread offense guy. He's a tempo guy. And he's trying to run spread and tempo with David Shaw's players that are much more physical, bigger players. It's more predicated on zone runs, chewing the ball, uh, chewing the clock, running the ball. Finding Io Manor now is the first weapon where he can anchor this spread offense. That's why they were so lost early in the year, because they were running one system, but their players were designed to run another system. So now that confidence comes, now expect uh, Io Manor to be that linchpin to then perhaps allow an EJ Smith to get off, to perhaps allow a Philkins to get off more in terms of play variety and allow Troy Taylor to open up his playbook a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And this team is still with a lot of flaws, you know, 82nd in the nation uh, when it comes to total offense, but total defense, we're talking about the 124th ranked team in the country. There's 130 division one teams for reference there. And I mean, they are 129th in pass defense. So what I'm looking at when it comes to this, the only team that has a worse pass defense is South Carolina for reference. What I'm looking at coming into this game is a game where Dante really needs to build confidence and what better time it is than now against a Stanford team that has struggled in the secondary 
defending the pass. You know, we've talked about, you know, implementing the run game a little bit more, Madman, but I went and looked at the stats today. We rank 10th in the nation right now in yards per game on the ground. You know, so it's it's kind of ironic where we feel like we got to run the ball more and we're still a top 10 rushing team within the country. Talk to me about the game plan you trot out there for a guy that, you know, has has seen his confidence dip a little bit with some of these turnovers. Well, I think you said it best. And I know there's been some criticism this week about some of the play calling selection with UCLA vis-a-vis the Oregon State game being on the road. But I, I agree with you. I think you have to find that balance to be a credible threat here moving forward. And you have to be able to set up Dante for success. Isn't it ironic, Will, that UCLA is 10th in the country in rushing? And that includes a nine-yard rushing performance? Just think if UCLA in that Utah game gets maybe 60 yards instead of nine. You know, they're, they're looking at being a top five rushing team. So you're still one of the preeminent running teams in the country. That's going to be there. I don't expect Carson Steele to have another 20-plus carry game because I think this is a game where it's going to be some Harden. It's going to be some Keegan Jones. It's going to be some Steele. It might also be a game for Yankoff and Anthony Atkins to get some run and really split the carries across the board. This is a game for Carson Steele to potentially get refreshed again and not have his usage rate so high. I fully expect the Bruins to be able to run the ball effectively. But this is a game for Dante. This, When we think about this second half of the season, it's four games, Will. The journey now to USC. And that is the third game that we have talked about all year as being the third game where UCLA is going to be an underdog And how can they build an offensive identity that's predicated not just exclusively on the run, but also on the throw to be a viable threat in that game and potentially run the table from here on out? So this is the game where I'm looking for J. Michael Sturdivant to kind of get back on track. You know, Will, he's obviously the most explosive weapon vertically on this team. 136 yards in that coastal game. Hasn't really been able to get off after that, not because he can't get open, but because of offensive line reasons and protection reasons, not being able to throw the ball down the field. This is a game where I want to see Carson Ryan, the most athletic tight end, get involved. This is a game for Cam Brown to kind of take it to the next level here. He seems to be Dante's, if outside of Loya, his favorite target in third down situations, fourth down situations. This is a game for Cam Brown to get loose. And then, of course, an opportunity for Loya to have a similar San Diego State-like performance and get into the end zone again and be open. So this is, to me, Will, if it's a ball game where UCLA, the score doesn't even really matter to me as much. If this is a game where Dante only has maybe 150 yards throwing and UCLA ends up rushing for 350 and they get 500 yards and win the ball game, it's actually failure. This needs to be a game where it's about 250 to 300 through the air and about, you know, 200 to 250 on the ground because this is a game where you need to be able to show that you can throw the ball. If you can't throw the ball in this game and you're sub 200 yards against the 129th pass defense in the country, it's going to be really tough sledding to be a viable threat, not just at USC, but also at Arizona. So it's not just about the score. It's not just about the yards. Here, yards distribution really matters, and this is a game we want to see Dante get over 250. Yeah, I mean, I am all for that, and I think we've got to mix up the opening drive game plans, though, because we started coming out hot. You know, the last three games, we've had three first possession turnovers when it comes to the game, and it's all been interceptions. Run the ball. Run the ball to start. Run the ball early. Run it often is my opinion, and if you have success doing that, you know, I mentioned the Stanford defense is not ideal. It's not great for them in the Cardinal fan base. They're allowing 4.61 yards per carry right now, which ranks in the high 90s nationally when it comes to that area. So if you run the ball effectively like we know Chip Kelly can, you know, like we talked about, he had a nine-yard rushing performance and you're still a top 10 rushing team. This guy is one of the all-time geniuses within the sport when it comes to rushing the football. Make that your identity, and what that opens up is the play-action pass which just makes it easier for your quarterback instead of attacking through the air to start where your defense can make the plays. So if you can run the ball early, you can run it effectively, 
that makes Dante's job easier as a passer as the field will open up for him before his eyes. I agree on Sturdivant. I agree on Logan Loya. I'm going to ask you what we do every single week, Madman. One player on offense and one player on defense that you believe will dictate the outcome of this game for UCLA. Well, I, so I, I love the question. And I think that it's one of those where I hope it's not one player that's going to dictate the outcome of this game, you know, but I, in, in, for, for this particular week, to me on offense, I think we've said it, but I want to hit the drum a little bit more is it's Dante. Moore. And for me, what I want to see from him, you said it best, Will, it's, it's the run setting up the throw. And I've talked about this earlier in the week. I want to see three things. I think there's three things Chip can do to fix Dante, quote unquote, if you will. First is make, if he's going to roll out, make him roll out to a strong side. He's had multiple interceptions where he's rolled to his left, his weak arm. He's had to turn his body. It's floated the ball and it's created interceptions. The second is you want him to survey the field right to left, not left to right. A young quarterback is going to want to survey the ball right to left. It's a lot easier to be able to go through your progressions. Put J. Michael Sturdivant to his right and not to his left, where he's forced the ball and had pick sixes down the sideline. So right to left progressions. And then third, the clock in his head has to be quick, and it has to go as following. Read one read two, and then either run or throw the ball away. Those are the three things that I'm really going to be looking for in this Stanford game out of Dante Moore. And then from a defensive side, what I would love to see is we talked about him last week, but I want to see him show out is Kamari Ramsey in kind of the Kamari Ramsey bowl game, if you will. Because if you recall, Will, and you certainly do being an expert, it came down to Stanford and UCLA he was very close to signing with Sanford. I want to see him really show out in this particular game against the team that also wanted him so desperately. And when you factor in Io Manor being so hot and Ramsey building that momentum of being the torch taker from Stefan Blaylock, this is the ideal game for him to just kind of solidify his role as the leader of the secondary. So it might not be the most creative selections, Will, but I'm going Dante Moore, and I'm going Kamari Ramsey. I love it, man. Dante Moore, uh, we need a big game from him at the QB spot. Has had such, a, you know, a couple of rough moments out there where it's led the fan base to be a little scared about what could potentially happen out there on the football field. And with Kamari Ramsey just coming off of arguably his best game so far in a Bruins uniform, tied for the team lead in tackles, led the team in tackles for a loss. This is a guy that can really come out there and make a difference. Madman, I've got... Keegan Jones on offense. This is a guy that I think we're going to need that big play rushing. And the small sample that we have seen from him, you know, after the first four games, we didn't even know if he was going to get any playing time. Explodes on the scene in the Washington State game. Only got three touches, but it was for 45 yards and two touchdowns. We dubbed that the Keegan Jones game against Washington State, given what he was able to do on that 22-yard touchdown as well as a 13-yarder that he was able to put into the end zone. And last week against Oregon State, only had four touches as well at three carries, 31 yards on the ground. And that awesome catch, you know, one catch, 26 yards, got it downfield. He was doing spin moves in the open field. Early players. I mean, this is a guy that was just electric every time he's touched the ball this year. And the natural inclination, I think, from the fan base is just go feed this guy the ball more. You know, I want to see more Keegan Jones. I think him getting the ball more, especially against a defense that has been struggling as much as Stanford has, I think it's a recipe for disaster for the Stanford defense. So feed your hottest player right now. It's Keegan Jones. He almost reminds me of some of those like Jamal Crawford off the bench moments where it's like, you guys just got to keep this guy out there. This guy just got 20 points in the last 10 minutes, you know, or whatever it may be on some of these hot streaks that Crawford would go on. Your Jordan Clarkson's, your Lou Williams, whatever it may be. He's almost like a six man at this point because he doesn't get the time as a typical starter, but boy, does he make the most of him coming off the bench. So Keegan Jones, is a guy I'm looking for there. And then on the defensive side of the ball, I'm actually going to go with Grayson Murphy, man. The Murphy twins have been outstanding. Latu has been able to do what he's been able to do because of the Murphy twins. Gabriel and Grayson have been awesome. Grayson is the guy I'm targeting this week. He you know, finished second in PFF rankings coming into this point on the team so far off of the defensive line. I'm just really excited and proud of what these guys have developed into on the defense. 
Uh, so I think I've got uh, Gabriel and Grayson Murphy as my, you know, second guys on defense where I think they're going to be very, very solid coming out there. What do you think of those two picks as we head to Stanford week? Oh, I love them, Will. I think they're terrific. I'll start with the Murphy twins. I think this is an ideal game for them to make a massive impact because A, Stanford has a hard time running the ball and has been evidence this season. Their leading rusher, Philkins, is only at 206 yards rushing, Will, through six games which is a paltry number. I mean, you're talking about 35 yards per game for your leading rusher. So it's going to allow the Murphy twins to pin their ears back and really go after Ashton Daniels, who's a bigger kid. He's a thicker kid, not as mobile in the pocket. So it's a recipe for disaster for Daniels and a recipe for ultimate success for the Murphy twins. I love it. And then the Keegan Jones call, Will, this is that perfect game for a gadget player like Keegan Jones to find spaces in the field to really make a huge impact and really allow Chip to figure out how best do I use Keegan Jones, not just in terms of the play calls that I like, but situationally sides of the field. Where do I dial him up the best? I absolutely love the Jamal Crawford reference there with that that crossover that Crawford always had, that behind the back crossover. Keegan Jones with those spins and the hurdles is the equivalent of the Jamal Crawford behind the back crossover. So let's see our sixth man do really well here on Saturday. Man, yeah. Well, you nailed it, man. We had a lot of basketball references on this <laughs> show today. A lot of good talk. Does UCLA actually hold on for the victory on Saturday? Give me your take. Absolutely, Will. This is going to be a victory. I think it, early in the game, I could see Stanford kind of hang in there for about a quarter just coming off of the momentum of last week, being at home, being very excited to play. But ultimately, this is going to be UCLA pulling away in, in quarters two and onwards. I fully expect UCLA to get to 40 points for the first time this season and, and win a convincing ball game uh, going into next week. I've got it similar to the San Diego State game where we put up 35 points. I think it was 35 to like 17 or something like that. Set 35 to 10. 35 to 10, yep. Yeah, 35 10. And you came away looking, you know, saying we looked phenomenal out there. The score, you know, could have been 20 points higher. It felt that good for us with a true freshman quarterback. I'm going to go 35 to 17 in this game as well. I just think and believe what UCLA is going to be doing is running the football effectively. Dante is going to hit some deep balls to, uh, this week, which I think is really going to help out the offense. And UCLA is going to roll in this game. So 35-17. Stanford's going to fight around for a little bit. You know, they're coming off of one of the bigger wins they've had in the last few years, given Stanford's you know downfall with David Shaw. But I really believe this is going to be a big victory for UCLA to get them back on track. Madman, thank you so much for joining. As always, UCLA fans, please uh, like and subscribe. Make, us, make sure to check us out on the Bruin Bible. Make sure you guys are listening to 1090 The Mightier here on ESPN Radio. We are out. Have a great weekend and look forward to speaking with you soon.